I'm Andrew Kitley, and this is my podcast, The Invisible Gift, a show about turning disability into possibility. From a young age, I was told I had a disability that would make it impossible for me to achieve and flourish in life. I struggled in school and felt I was not truly understood or supported. On my long road to becoming the owner of multiple businesses, I have learned that dyslexia was not my disability, but rather my invisible gift. My dyslexia challenged me every day, but it was also what made me into an independent thinker, a creative and gave me that hardworking mindset that has taught me to never be discouraged by failure. I realized there are many people out there just like me. So I wanted to learn more about them and dyslexia itself. I realized I needed a way to do this, which was great for dyslexics, which obviously rules out writing anything down and makes total sense why a podcast is perfect. I'm excited to be sharing this journey with you as we learn more about dyslexia, the incredible people that thrive with it and how we can all transform our greatest challenge into our invisible gift. Welcome to my podcast. Today on The Invisible Gift, we have Grant Harold, aka The Royal Butler. Grant is an etiquette expert, a professional butler, and worked directly for the Prince of Wales for several years. You may know Grant from the BBC series Country House, or from his hilarious YouTube videos featuring his dogs. Grant and I spoke at length about his experiences with dyslexia, the royal family, his work in media, and his plans for the future. But first, I asked him why he wanted to become a butler in the first place and how his journey in that profession began. So Grant, unbelievable job for everyone listening. You were a royal butler and quite an impressive uh, resume I've been reading. And I was, so really, let's start with, I'm going to start with outside of dyslexic year for a second and because it's new for me. What's... um. What made you decide to do that job? That's a, it's, it's blown my mind, really. When when I was a youngster, you know, when you're obviously at school and, and everyone's talking about their careers and what they want to do. And, you know, all my friends wanted to be policemen or firemen or work in the bank. And to me, they were all boring. You know, I wanted to do something different. So uh, the two, if you like, uh, ambitions or dreams one was to go into acting. I love theatre. Uh, I love the idea of entertaining people. Uh, I even started a drama club in my primary school. And then in 1993, there was the movie Remains of the Day. And of course, it was all about Anthony Hopkins, the Stevens, the butler, with Emma Thompson, the housekeeper. And I was amazed at this, this, this role of somebody that just make, makes everything happen. And I thought, wouldn't that be an amazing job to do that because to me that was just such a fun thing to do and so both of them as I said were equally things that I'd like to do and what's really strange is when I went into the profession there was no butler in 20 25 years ago it's not like how it is today I mean it was very very few and far between jobs so it was really bizarre and strange that one I got into it and two, that I actually got to work for the people I got to work for because it, it just doesn't really happen like that. So it is very much as if, you know, kind of waving a magic wand and, and it happened. And that's, that's how it seems to have happened for me. I've been really lucky. So when you, when you was at school, let's talk a bit, obviously, a little bit about the dyslexia. When you was at school, did you notice any differences in how you were learning compared to your peers? Um, at the beginning stages or was it more later on in your life you realised? I think, uh, funny enough, I've got all my um, report cards. Can you believe it? How sad is that? I've kept all my school report cards and I sometimes look back, you know, kind of read what, what was said about me and it's really interesting because the one thing that comes out and bear in mind, this is when I'm quite young, so we're talking about from the age of, of seven to probably about 12. The one thing that comes out is apparently I was a chatterbox, which is obviously a good thing for entertaining. Uh, I was also very creative, very, very creative. Um, but I did struggle with my English and I struggled with maths. So all the kind of things that they felt that were important, I was struggling with. And the things that they felt were not as important, the creative side, they felt, um, you know, obviously I was doing really well with it. And, and in a way, they, they supported that and they encouraged it because I think they thought, well, He's not really that great at the other stuff. 
but n- not at any point did anyone say to me, um, you know, you, you've, there's obviously a, a problem. Nobody, nobody said that. So I just went along just, if I'm being completely truthful, thinking maybe I'm just a little bit thick. Maybe I'm just, you know, slightly backwards like this and that's just how it is. And you, you, you don't talk about it. It was never talked about. You just assume that's what's going on. And it's when you get to high school, it's when it's it's not quite the same, is it? Because then you're in a, a, a different environment and, and then it does become more noticeable. And then it is a case of, what is wrong with me? You know, why why am I why am I struggling with these things? So once again, I, I focused on the things that I was I was good at, the creative stuff and the other stuff, I the important bits actually, my hires and everything, I, I just turned away from. You know, I didn't even complete my hires because I, I was I was struggling. So when you what was you what was you great at? Because that's really kind of what I like to get down to. Um you say the creative side. So, what areas of creative side did you more excel in? Was it was it mainly because you said you wanted to do acting originally? Mm. So, was it mainly drama? Yeah. Because it seems to be yeah. a more regular occurrence. The drama. It was it was drama because I I was very uh, as I said I started a, a drama school sorry a drama club at my primary school and then I joined the drama classes at my high school and I couldn't get enough of it. You know I I, I loved the whole. Um, you know, so for example, in my English class, I struggled, really struggled. When I was in the drama class, I could mm. go into a character and entertain my whole my whole group, and they would be in hysterics at me kind of doing some silly little sketch or something. And and that's when I realised that that was something that I enjoyed. And also, uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I was bullied. You know, which is reality of of you know it does happen obviously at schools and not just at school, um, but it does happen. And for me, the, the drama was, a, a, was an escape. You know, it's going into this make-believe world, if you like. And so I threw myself probably more so into it because of, of suffering bullying and things as a, as a kid. And, and I'm really grateful because I think if I hadn't kind of focused on that, it's really helped me oddly, weirdly, it's helped me with what I do today. Even as a butler, I mean, as a butler, you have to act. So it, it's without question, it was the, the, the perfect thing to focus on. But little did I realise how much it would help me. I'm going to ask a question because, and excuse my ignorance in this question. <laughs> Why is it? A, because I think we all have an image of what a butler actually does. And I don't think many people know. So I'm sure everyone else is as interested as I am. <laughs> what, what skills does a butler need and what do they, what do they actually do? It's the thing about a butler. So the modern day butler is very different to the butler, uh, say Carson and Downton Abbey. The, the the butlers back then were in charge of big households. They kind of looked after the the running of the of the pantries, the dining room, uh, the wines. Where today the butlers are a personal assistant. So the liches, I, I've said many times before, they turn the hand to everything. So. What I mean by that is they can, one minute they can find themselves serving a meal, then they can find themselves maybe doing some housekeeping, then possibly doing some valeting, uh, valeting looking after looking after clothes, uh, looking after children. I even at one point helped look after children, looking after animals, running shopping errands. So it's it's very much a, a modern day uh, personal assistant. And the biggest thing about the, the butler is it's being able to know what somebody wants before they ask for it. That's when you know you're doing a good job. If you can, in a in a day, a course of a day, actually have everything planned for your principal, your employer, and you know what they're going to want before they even know that that's that's what makes a good butler today. But you know, it's it's, it's evolving all the time. It has to because the, the way society evolves. This brings me onto the percent that I find quite interesting because with dyslexia, with my dyslexia, I find organisational things and absolute nightmare whereas for you that's probably sounds like the most important part of your job yeah the the organization part of it is a big part of it and it's funny you should say that because i it, it, don't get me wrong i do i do struggle with that um because for example when so as a butler one of the things you have to do is you have these meetings um obviously with the principals with the family to discuss what's happening um for the week ahead uh, with the raw family it's, it's months ahead but you know with, with the other family it can weeks ahead and so you've got to plan things and and I always find it really important I had to write things down because I was I would, I would never remember and and, I, and you know I had to kind of um, 
I had to kind of, so for example, that say there was a housekeeper there, uh, she would go away and she would memorise the whole thing, the whole week, no problem. But I would, I would have to keep going back to my notes. I'd have to keep going over what it is I'm doing literally all the time. Otherwise, I would, I would struggle with it. But as soon as I knew what I was doing, um, then it, 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 it was second nature. It wasn't, it wasn't a problem. But, um, so I am good at the organisation, but I do have to keep correcting myself and checking what I'm doing. Otherwise, I would, I would, I would get confused with it. How did you, because you, you didn't really just become a butler. You probably become the top butler you could probably become <laughs> the, uh, in the world, working for <laughs> the most famous family in the world. Um, what aspects of, if any, and I mean, I, I'm, I don't like to just attribute anything good or bad to dyslexia, but what mm. attributes of dyslexia do you think help you ascend up that that chain to get where you eventually got? I, I think people with dyslexia, and it's also the people that may not even know they, they have it. You know, people, I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't even know, but I think something that, that, that is a common ground for everyone is a determination um i think maybe you agree with that it's it, you you seem to have a you know you there's something that makes you want to do things and get get it not just right you want to do it to the best of your ability and even when i decided i was going to be a butler and this is the funniest conversation i had with my my parents you know when i decided i was going to be a butler and they thought i'd completely lost the plot because Technically, there was no butlers that we knew of, or, or you know, anyone doing that. Um, but I, not only did I say I was going to be a butler, I think I actually said I was going to be a butler to uh, the royal family. I think I actually said, I think you'll find, look, in fact, I can tell you for a fact, my first day as a, a trainee butler was the 1st of September 1997. And quite a few people will remember that was quite a an important day because it was the day after Princess Diana um, was killed in the car crash. And it was that day when I started in this private household in Scotland. And on that very day, I decided that I was going to work for the royal family and it would be my goal to look after Princess William and Harry to make sure they were safe. Now, this is, I was 19 at this point. This is how I, I felt, like with the rest of the country. And that's exactly what I did. You know, and I did it within, uh, I think it was within about six, seven years which isn't that long. You know, if you were, it's like an apprenticeship. I mean, it's not, seven years isn't long to suddenly get to that top, that top job. I suppose when you're leading, because as a butler, you, you, I assume you lead quite a few members of staff as your main port of call. What, what was the, what strengths did you, did you bring on board? Because there must've been some of them that were noticed more by these amazing families you worked for i am a royalist so i'm going to celebrate every second of it um so what was the the main strengths you brought from from your background in being more creative and having opposing strengths to other people do you know what i think it was i i think and i know this for a fact from um having conversations with with if we say the royals for example um because i didn't try to be anything I wasn't, if that made sense. So I was always very much Grant. I was myself. Now, when I did the role of a butler, so let's say there was other people around, I would go into that character, go back to my acting, I'd have the suit on, I would, uh, I would know how to act, how to behave, how to do it. When there wasn't guests around, and say I was with um, the, the, the young princes or, or the prince, I would be myself. And that is something I know that they liked because I wasn't trying to be any different. I was just being Grant and they liked me for it. I mean, I used to, I've never really talked about this, but I mean, I used to kind of have the prince in hysterics that things I'd say or do or, you know, I'd get, being dyslexic, I, I, I could get confused, you know, with words and, and the way I wrote things. And I remember on many occasions, I'd be on the phone to the, to the prince um, talking to him about something and then suddenly I would, I'd be trying to say something and I, I couldn't get it across and it would come out so hysterically funny and I remember kind of worrying and thinking oh he's gonna he's gonna think what's this chap up to but he he found it I think he thought it was really he thought it was really great he obviously didn't know um about the dyslexia side of it but I think he thought it was you know I used to just kind of make him laugh and 
I think that's quite nice because when you see the kind of lies and the that they have, you know, the lead and and what goes on in a way when you can actually make them just be that relaxed and comfortable around you, that I think is a great attribute. I think that's a that's a really good thing. And then as far as the actual being a butler and being in charge of staff, again, I was always myself. Uh, I didn't try to, as I said, I didn't try to be any different. The the tricky side would be if you had to be um, what's the word? Uh, uh, more authoritative. Um, to say th- this is something that did go against me in my age because I was quite young as a butler. Um, you know, we're talking about early twenties, and you'd have staff that have been there for many, many years, uh, and not just in the royal house, but in my previous jobs. And if you were, say, in charge of butler on duty, which is what it was called, especially with the royal household, you'd suddenly be given. Uh, you know, you'd be the point of contact between the royal and the other staff. So you're passing on the instructions of what they're supposed to be doing. And I'm not going to say they didn't like it, but it it probably was, you, you had to suddenly go into that um, zone of, of you've been given instructions by the royal and you're passing them on to the next person. And you had to, you know, if the person suddenly, I don't know, didn't like it or there was a problem, you had to stand your ground on it. And that was something I found really difficult because I'm a really, I'm actually a really nice guy. You know, I'm, I'm not, I haven't, I don't think I've kind of got a bad bone in my body. Um, but at the same time, sometimes you've got to go into that more uh, authoritative side. And I had to, because at the end of the day, if you're getting instructions from uh, one of the princes or, or dare I even say the queen, and you have to pass that on to somebody, you've got to make sure that you do it in the right way and, and it's, it's, it's carried out. So that was that was the tricky bit. But do you know what? I, I did it and, and obviously must have done something right because, you know, luckily um, it all went really well. You know, when I did give the instructions, they were carried out and, and you know, things, things just happened. I think about nerves when I think about your job because I don't know, I think a lot of people who listen may agree with me on this, but when you think about high society, You think about academic achievers um, because you think they're probably going to, and it might be wrongly, they're going to be educated quite highly. When you first got into this, did you worry about being not academically enough to run in these sort of circles? Mm. Um, No, um, it's funny. The one thing I've discovered you know, th- these people, um, whether it's royals or the aristocracy, they, uh, as you've said, they, they obviously have a, an amazing education, which some of us don't even get, you know, close to, um, whether it be private tuition or, or the private schools. Um, and but what I found interesting was they are probably very good at, um, at what they do. But, you know, other things I found that I had strengths and it's hard to explain to you, but there's things obviously that I'd learn or things that I could do that they couldn't. I, and I know that sounds silly, but it suddenly made me realize that, that you know, I think um, it's been, there was a wonderful book, uh, and I can't remember what it was, I think it was called The Queen's Handbag or something, or it, I read it a long time ago. And it talked about um, if the royal study didn't have staff or the aristocracy. And it said about how they would probably struggle with the day-to-day function of things. For example, um, I don't know, changing the the what well, is back in the days when cars had spark plugs, you know, doing those kind of those kind of tasks. Mind you, the queen I think could because I think she's very she's very good at a lot of things. It wouldn't surprise me. But um, I think the point being yeah. is that there's obviously things that they're not they're not um, probably that good at. And so in a way, they, they, that then makes you what you do valuable, if that makes sense. But uh, so I didn't, I don't think I ever kind of worried or kind of felt out of my depth. But what I will say is that um, I, as a youngster, I, I was also a, a royal citizen. I, I used to always try to catch a glimpse of the royal family up at Memorial in Scotland, because that's obviously where home was. Uh, well, Adriel's home, we used to go up to see them. So when I actually came face to face with them, yes, I was nervous, but it wasn't because of, of feeling uh, not at their level. It was more to do with how famous these people were. You know, sadly, I'm, I'm, I'm in a room with some of the most famous people in the world, um, especially when I met the prince and, and the queen. And th- that, absolutely, I was nervous because you suddenly think, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? You know, how do I get this right? And, you know, the first meeting with the prince, I, I remember being so nervous, I can't even tell you, but he was great because this is something he's very good at, is making people feel very relaxed and comfortable around him. 
So even though I was a, 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 a quivering wreck, you know, he, he was great at make me feel comfortable, let me sit down um, with him and having a conversation with him. And, you know, I remember, this is the first time I met the Prince, and I, I was actually an interview, and I remember kind of thinking, nobody's going to believe I'm actually sitting in Clarence House in the drawing room with the Prince of Wales, having a cup of tea, <laughs> talking about life. You know, this is just, this just doesn't happen. But uh, yeah. there you go, it did happen. So so that's when I was nervous. So that, that kind of thing made me nervous. But as far as the actual um, kind of day-to-day being around them and, and that kind of thing, you it, it's just, it's different. You know, they've got strength, I've got strength. And I think at the end of the day, they're all working together because that's what it is. You are working with them, even though you work for them, you still have to work with them. And it all kind of, it, if I can say, it all kind of just works really well. I find it amazing how Harold has worked with some of the most important people on the planet, but remains so charming and open. I admire his ability to adapt and overcome some of the organisational challenges we all suffer from being dyslexic. He's such a good communicator and a wonderful people person, which is definitely something I've noticed recording this show. Coming up, we speak about his popular YouTube channel, how he deals with other people's judgment, and how he first realised he was dyslexic. But before that, I wanted to find out a bit more about his online etiquette school. You've now moved on to create your own online etiquette courses, which, by the way, sounds amazing. I might have to book myself in on one because (laughs) my etiquette's terrible. Um, (laughs) Why is etiquette important? to you because before we move into the strengths of what you're doing for your dyslexia and etiquette i wanted to know why it's important to you because ironically it's important to me my dad was um you would have thought he was a royal butler the way he made our table manners had to be spot on or we were in trouble (laughs) so why is etiquette what would you say etiquette's important to you so from a young age um my parents used to uh especially at christmas or celebrations would lay up tables and they would teach me about the, the do's and don'ts of, of dining. So I was quite interested from quite a young age. And then when I joined uh, the Duke of Bedford, or Marcus of Tavistock as he was, he was a real stickler for things being done the right way via etiquette and, and politeness. You know, oh, wow, his manners were amazing. And um, he very much taught me what it was to be what I class as a gentleman's gentleman. That's the butler to the gentleman so he taught me what it was to be a to be a gentleman and then the prince also did the same and when people used to come to meet the prince one of my jobs would be to make sure um well not i didn't have to but i used to kind of offer them advice and guidance of what to do around the royals for example the royal offers their hand to you first you do do you um you know where do you go and that's when someone said to me why don't you teach people how to behave around royals and I I thought who's going to want to learn about how to behave around royals little did I realize that this would become a full-time job so I travel not just the country I travel the world teaching people how to behave uh, around not just British royals but royals in general and an etiquette and then at the same time we established a butler school that we run at Blenheim Palace and again we have uh, we have royals that send staff, we have VIPs, we have um, celebrities, fashion designers, you name it, they come through the doors, we teach them. And and so this has allowed me to, kind of, the creative side, if you like, it's allowed me to kind of now develop it into other areas. And the other creative part is I've, I've been doing television work since I was uh, 21. Uh, the very first butler job I had at Woburn Abbey, the BBC were making a reality show there called Country House, and I got offered part of that. And so I've also been involved in television for the last 20 years as well. And and more recently, I, I've become more involved in day, daytime television, where they get gone as an etiquette expert, or the Royal Butler, as I've been nicknamed, uh, the Royal Butler has become uh, the kind of authority on, on British etiquette and manners. And I've even took this to YouTube. And there is now an amazing following under the Royal Butler, which is even verified, you know. And and so this is the creative side. This is what I'm talking about. This creative side is is allowed me to even create a bit of an eccentric character, a butler character. Uh, yes, it's me, but it's me being yeah. the that yeah. butler persona. So obviously you do teaching, and I do you take your learnings from uh, the issue the issues you would have had learning when you you were younger. 
when you teach these to other people, do you, do you factor them in? Because obviously a lot of dyslexic people learn through like kinesthetics and audio rather than um, written. So do you, when you teach, in, in, do you factor that into your learning styles? I, I don't have a lot of, um, there's not a huge amount of written material that I offer because it's, it, it, can you imagine, it'd be, it'd be like hieroglyphics, you know, with my writing. So I, I focus more, as you said, on visual <laughs> uh, and practical. So, you know, and, and they make their own notes. They make their notes. Don't get me wrong. I've had people help me put things together so we can give things out to the students, you know, course notes and, and information. But a lot of that I try to get them to, to do. And... It is a struggle because uh, the other thing I'll quickly mention is I've obviously got a website. And I had, um, a couple of years ago, I, I came under fire from a couple of the, two of the biggest papers in the country. And they, I came under fire because they had obviously read about me and they were basically saying I was thick. Uh, they were saying he can't even string two words together on his website. And I was really hot by this because uh, I couldn't see the mistake. I looked at it and I couldn't see it. And of course, it was it was it was badly written. I had somebody look at it, and we had to have it all redone. And it upset me that the the paper instead of contacting me and, and speaking to me about it, and I could have said, "Look, I think I'm dyslexic. I think I've got a problem here." They, I didn't get the opportunity. They just automatically um, went for me. And it was soon after. Weirdly, I was given an etiquette class in Bath. And the British Dyslexia Association's um, the 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 chairman, the CEO at that point was actually there, and she was sitting next to me, and we got chat, and I didn't know who she was, I didn't know her background, and she was asking what I'd been up to. So I told her what had happened with this press, and that's when she said, "Well, I'm actually with the British Dyslexia Association, and." I think we can we can help you. We can we can work with you, uh, and that's actually when I became an ambassador for them as well. And it, it was just the timing was really weird. But but even since then, it, it still shocks me how quickly people will um, go for you if there's anything wrong. Not just in your website, even in social media. If something's not grammatically spot on, they come for you. And and I find it really sad that. You know, people do that without actually thinking. It might not just dyslexia. There could be some other medical reason that people are struggling, and it's just wrong that they don't actually think about it. And that's what I'm trying to. So I'm also trying to put that out, even in my teachings. You know, I'm, I'm trying to say to people when it comes to etiquette and politeness in society, you know, you've got to remember, especially with social media, uh, you've got to be very careful what you say because you don't actually know what what's going on uh, the other side of that communication that you know that person you don't know what's going on and recently i've been putting tweets up along those lines just to remind people that you know um just because you think they're just being silly or lazy that might not be the case yeah uh media is not really known for its tactfulness in certain areas and especially when you have a have a, um a relationship with the royal family you're definitely going to get attacked more yeah yeah that that's that's the problem <laughs> the, um i've had that a lot in my career i'm a structural engineer by trade and it is the assumption that structural engineers can do pretty much everything you can put your mind to academically when in fact it's not actually always the case and i think people are very quick to judge about what we do and what's funny is you said this i always say this about disabled people uh that that when tom parks in disabled bay and you see someone else having a go at them and you it's like they kind of expect someone to crawl out of a car rather than because disability comes in so many forms and that's kind of how i feel mm. about dyslexia people can't see it's it's it's, it's funny it's a bit like fat shaming and skinny shaming it's bad to sh fat shame uh, it's all right to fat shame people but skinny shame people is more acceptable and i find this is very i find a lot of dyslexic people i speak to go through this a lot and it's doesn't seem to change as you get older it's the same but what's great is we normally run our own businesses or do very successful jobs that make us feel <laughs> a lot better about ourselves you're right and, and this is the thing you know people as you get older you um it's weird, isn't it? You think as we get older, we get wiser or, or more 
uh, well, so not sympathetic, but you know, thoughtful about things. We don't. We as we get older, we seem to get more. You know, especially it's it's actually the older generation. Of, if anyone's ever attacked me, it's, it's always people that are slightly older. Or the grammar priests, as they like to call themselves, and and it's what you said. It's it it doesn't matter, you know, whether it comes down to the, the fat shaming or or or, um, or or race or um, sexual orientation. You know, the, the people seem to forget. They forget. And and mental health. There's another big thing that I'm really passionate about. Mental health. You know, I'm I'm a huge believer. I I I've always. Yeah, I've, I've I've always been a huge believer that everybody, to some degree, um, ha, has some sort of of mental health. I, I honestly believe that. I've always thought that, even when I was little, before anyone ever talked about it. Um, but at the same time, you know, people that suffer from mental health, you know, if they if they're having a, a let's say a bad day, and they suddenly put, oh, you know, you, you they'll type something, they'll put something, and of course it's going to come out wrong, and people go for them, and that's not what those people need, and. I, this is again why I did a tweet recently, and I put up a picture of an apple, and you know, and I kind of said, you know, you've got to remember that what you see is not always what you what what you think of something. And the other side of the apple is is been eaten. So it, it, one side looks perfect, the other side isn't. And it's kind of saying to people, this is what we've always got to remember um, that you know, especially again with the dyslexia. You've got to understand. People don't understand it, or they don't. They don't. Um, don't want to understand it. Um, but you've got to be really careful because you know you're not. It 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 does upset people. It upset me when when the papers had a go at me. Um, and I've you know I've got quite a tough skin, but that that upset me because I suddenly thought, what have I done wrong? You know, I'm trying to make a living. I'm trying to have a make a successful business and suddenly I'm getting attacked for it you kind of think well, you know why uh, you know what have I done to, to them you know uh, I haven't bought their papers since I'm sure they're going to miss my my 60p or whatever it is um but you know that 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 that's kind of how you can have to turn it you have to kind of turn it around and make it a bit of fun you know get a bit of then say you know what okay it's fine I'm not worried about it, it it's not doing me any harm it hasn't affected my business I'll just pick myself up dust myself off and carry on so do you find other people's judgment uh, fuel you or or sometimes push you back or how do you how do you work through that? When I was younger, um, if something set me back, I would I'd get upset, you know, I would get upset and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't attack. I would just I would just kind of cower away and hide, uh, if you like. When now uh, and again, maybe it's as you get older and you get wiser. You you do suddenly get to a point where you think you know I'm not going to take that you know I'm 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 not going to obviously uh, have a huge argument with somebody because somebody said something that I'm not happy about it, but at the same time I'm not just going to take it and and so I think it makes you stronger I, I really do I think it it gives you a strength and you actually you know, the world we live in today even though it does happen and we've just said you know that there is people that attack people for all sorts of reasons. But society as a whole are becoming more supportive of people that have got um, disabilities or uh, anything. You know, the, the, the majority of people now support it, and thankfully so do celebrities and can I even say royals. So there's a, a there's a, a great support network there. So when people do stand up, they're not standing alone. There is other people there that do support them, and I think that's really important. But I, I've definitely um, got to a point where when anyone kind of mistreats me or I feel that I'm being um, treated differently for whatever reason, including obviously dyslexia, then I stand up to them. And, but, but the way I do it, and, and just to give you a very quick example, if somebody has a, a, a go at me now for my, say one of my tweets, so say I do a tweet and, and there's a problem with it, and it'll be a silly mistake, it'll be, I forgot a comma or uh, an apostrophe, or whatever it is, uh, and they'll have a go about it. And now what I do, before I used to get angry or, well, originally I'd get upset and do nothing. And then I'd get angry and then I'd want to say something. You think, but you've got to remember, this person could also be having a bad day. So now what I say to them is, you know, thank you so much for support, supporting British dyslexia. Now may I ask you to go to the website and pledge something, you know, and, and you never hear from them again. You never hear from them again. Or sometimes I'll get a yeah. private message with a, 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 an no. they'll get a little, they'll get an apology written to you. You know, saying I'm so sorry. I should have known. And and then and then I go back and say, look, I'm not trying to have a go. You know, it's just you've just got to remember when you say something, just bear in mind what you're saying. And that's that's gonna deal with it. So I think in a way, 
rather than hiding from it, you've got to address it, if I can say publicly, especially in social media, but in a way that's not, you're not attacking them, but you're thanking them for understanding, you know, and, and even though they haven't understood, that's the whole point. You do it in a way where they then go, oh, what have I done? Um, because some people, I think, generally just don't, just don't understand, just don't get it. Although the story of how Grant found out he was dyslexic may surprise you, it didn't surprise me. So many people in the UK don't know they're dyslexic until they're adults. It's such a shame because learning you have dyslexia allows you to embrace it. I can relate so much to Grant's frustration with being misunderstood and spoken down to because of his dyslexia. Grant tells us a few more stories about some hilarious misunderstandings he's had, explaining what it's like to be a dyslexic working on television, and I ask him about his goals for the future. We also chat about technology and how it's changed everything for dyslexics. I don't know how you feel, but technology's really changed things for, uh, for dyslexic people. Uh, some good, some bad. And when I say bad, it's not bad as in other people notice it. But I have things, anything that corrects my spelling as I'm typing is amazing. But then half the time, I don't realise I can't spell until I have to write something by hand. And I realise how much my autocorrect's been doing for me so long. Yeah. Yeah, Gra- Grammarly is good as well. I-, I use an app called Grammarly, if I can say that. Um, it's, it's, you-, you pay for it, but it's not a lot. Uh, but really importantly, it actually, it-, it goes a little bit too far. It turns you into a-, a proper English professor, if I can say that. We don't need to be an English <laughs> professor. Um, but, you know, it, yeah. it-, it keeps you right. It-, it-, it keeps you right. The only thing is, it's funny you said about writing things in it. If I write a letter, I very rarely will make mistakes. I do I do love writing letters, which is probably good being an etiquette expert. But the only other thing I will say is how often, and I think you'll agree with me with this, how often have you done a tweet or a Facebook message or something and you sit there quite happily typing away, doing your message or on your phone uh, and you put it out there and you think nothing else about it. And I'll give you a very quick example. I had uh, a friend who was coming to my house for dinner. Um, I'm very lucky. I live, I live at Highgrove. Um, and Highgrove is, is where Prince Charles lives. He lives in the, he's got a, a big house um, called Highgrove House, which is beautiful and the gardens are amazing. If you, uh, I think they've reopened the gardens, but unfortunately with COVID, it might be closing again. Um, oh, actually, they've got to be careful with numbers, haven't they, I suppose. But what I was going to say was, a friend was actually coming to visit the, the prince and, or to see the prince about something. And then I invited her to come and have dinner. So I went on my Twitter, uh, and I, I, I'd already arranged to see her. And, you know, I said, looking forward to entertaining Emma this evening, because Emma's her name. And I put that up, and I had a little picture on my table. I'd laid up the table, and it all looked really nice. Didn't think any more about it. And about two minutes later, somebody that was actually in the, in the house with me starts shouting at me, have you just done a tweet? And I was like, yes, I have. They said, take it down. Take it down at once. And I was like, what? And they actually took my phone, thank God, they took my phone and, and deleted it. So I said, what is wrong with you? So, but when they deleted, they took a screenshot, sorry, and then deleted it. So they showed it to me and I read it back and I was going, there's nothing wrong with it. He said, read it out loud. So I read it out loud and I said, uh, looking forward to entering Emma this evening. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I've done things so, like that so, so much. So, <laughs> so this is not a good message to put out to the to the world or the universe. So this is what the Royal Butler's getting up to this evening. So um luckily Emma saw this. Emma saw it and, and she giggled and, and when she came down she said, I wasn't sure what I should be bringing and I was like, No 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 I said don't don't worry, it's fine. So um <laughs> so it was a very it was thank god she knows oh, me really well but otherwise i'd have been i'd have been mortified and you know and i think you made it funny but this is when i realized this is how it can go so badly <laughs> so badly wrong <laughs> i couldn't agree more i have done that so much and i my partner regularly says to me, what have you just written? Because we've got a family WhatsApp and we always write things on um, the family chat. And she's like, yeah. read what you've said. And I read it and I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that. There's not one mistake in that. And she does exactly the same. Read it out loud or write it again. Mm-hmm. And I write it and I'm like, oh, 
<laughs> that's gonna upset my brothers <laughs> or something like that because it's it's and you get you get annoyed as well don't you because when you've done it um it annoys you a little bit because it it, it, it it's funny but you also kind of go why how did i do that and you do end up kind of almost kind of like getting so angry at yourself you think how did i get that so wrong um and i did it again recently i wrote something and i literally made a word up i made a word you know and and you know my friend was coming back saying what does what is that you know what does that mean is this a new a new word and i was like yes it is you know i they're all battlers now creating words you know this is what we do um but i have no <laughs> idea you know how, how, it, how it just happens like that you know you, you you love your dash hounds don't you i've seen your instagram you're very partial to a dash hound is that right Yes, I am. I am. I am. How, it. Seems it's some really <laughs> rare thing that you seem to your partial to um, But yes, I am. Only, only, only because when I saw it, I thought, "Where's the corgis?" I thought he's got to be into corgis. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. See, here, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. So it, now, this is going to really test you as a royalty because the Queen historically used to have daxes, and the Queen Victoria had daxes. And then the queen started, then the queen had a corgi and she then bred mm. corgis and daxies and got doggies. Mm. And she still got doggies to this very day. So it's not a corgi, but it's still, daxies have still got royal status. So, um, and they were also the preferred hunting dog of the Egyptian kings, apparently. Um, way, yes. way back. They had longer legs. They've shrunk a little bit, obviously. I read that the other day. And that actually kind of brings me on to something else, which I, I ask everyone I speak to. Do you uh, do you read a lot? I I do, but not a, I, I read, but not a lot um, because I struggle with reading. Um, mm -hmm. I'll find if I read a book, I, I need to read the same, par the same paragraph about twice. Over and over again, yeah. You know, to take it in. Um, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. Have you tried audiobooks? Because they are they are a yeah, massive audiobooks. game changer. Audiobooks, audiobooks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Audiobooks are, are amazing. Do you know? Yeah, I, I've read different books over the years, and um, without going too down spiritual side of things, but uh, somebody a long time ago said to me about yeah, I should read an amazing uh, book called Conversations of God, and it's one of these. Uh, books that it kind of answers a lot of questions about different things, and I tried reading the book. Uh, there's a whole set of them, and I tried reading the, the first book, and I, I really struggled. I really struggled. And then somebody said about the audio version. So at night, I'd put on the headphones and 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 listen to a chapter. And I tell you what, it was not only was it amazing, it was actually the author reading it to you. And the author, because he had actually experienced some amazing things, it was really nice to get to hear his excitement in it. So I'm actually a huge fan of audiobooks. So even if I'm at home and dare I say I decide to do a bit of housekeeping, I'll then quite happily put uh, an audio uh, book on. In fact, recently I listened to Stephen Fry. Uh, it's one of his books from quite a few years ago, but he, he did one. And it's, it's great. It's great just hearing the person telling you their story in their own in their own words, literally. The audiobooks changed my life and the way I read. Um, I say read, sorry, listens probably more accurate. Uh, so much so that now, for instance, with the show notes for today and when I, I speak to other people, I have to get my, my partner phones me up when I'm out traveling for work and reads it out to me. And it's almost like listening to an audio book. And that's yeah. kind of what she's been yeah. doing for the yeah. last couple yeah. of weeks. And, yeah. and it really helps. It helps me retain the information because I have to hear it. Yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm in complete agreement with you. If I read something, I struggle to take it. And if I hear it, I, I get it, completely get it. The other thing is, very quickly, going back to the creative stuff as well, um, because that's one thing I'd be useless at, I, I think, is scripts. To say I, I'll give a, give, a, give a script. I have been given scripts, actually. I've done, um, I've done a couple of shows that I've done recently. I, I did some filming with Kelly Clarkson for her, for her um, talk show. And there was a, we did a, we did a bit of a scripted thing, which was really good fun. And I remember the producer coming into the, this is, I was out in LA for this last year. And the producer came into the, the dress, the most fabulous dress room, just to let you know, go to the States, they know how to look after you. Um, most fabulous <laughs> dress room. And he brings in a, a script. And he said, this is your, this is what you're going to be doing. And I'm looking at it and he said, this is what you're going to be saying. And I'm thinking, help. 
it's a bloody script, you know? So he goes away and I'm sitting here trying to re- read it out loud and everything. Uh, and I was fine. I, 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 I was able to do it. I think if I have to and, and you know, and because I enjoy it, you know, I did it. But what I find is that when I'm doing any filming and if the producer or the director will say to me, look, just say it as you feel. This is what we want you to say, but do it in your own words. I can do it, no problem. No problem at all. And I, I'm, I'm not too bad with auto cue, um, but again, I can get a bit, if if there's one I don't recognise, I can get stuck. So that's why, again, with my YouTube thing, you know, some people think I've scripted them. They're not. It's just, I let you just decide what I'm going to do. I just go out there and just just do it because that's what works. But but not just with that, also with filming, if I'm lucky and they let me do that, that that makes life a lot easier. So like most dyslexic, I'm sure you've got some big plans for the next 12 months. What have you got planned for the next 12 months? Covid's kind of changed everything, hasn't just now. So you know, at the moment, everything kind of revolves mm. obviously around that. But I'm I'm looking at um, you know, the back of school. I get some more courses running there at Blenheim because we obviously haven't done it this year. Um, I'm still doing filming. You know, what's amazing is, is you know, filming hasn't stopped at anything. Um, my film work has increased during the lockdown, and there seems to be more of a demand um, for for TV programs. So I'm, I'm kind of focusing on that. And I think as far as kind of big ideas, I mean, um, the YouTube thing that I've been having fun with, the, the what, what I call quarantine etiquette, it really took off. And, and I'm kind of thinking I want to do more along those kind of lines, more, more of that kind of thing. So I might convince the Dachshunds for some more treats to do some more of these videos. And... Um, and see where that goes, you know. I mean, there's been all sorts of, we've even been talking about doing an etiquette book. Um, you know, there's all sorts of ideas and plans. And the problem is, doing what I do, you never kind of know what, what's suddenly going to come up, you know, what you're going to be asked to do. Um, you know, the filming projects, literally, I find out about a week before and then and then you do it. And it's the same with the etiquette. You know, I've, I've had an amazing um, inquiry come in recently and if it, if it goes to plan, you know, it's, it's an amazing job. But they literally come in really quick and they happen quick and, and then, before you know, you're, you're doing it. So um, so there's lots of kind of other exciting things coming up. But as I said, the, 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 the videos I've been filming, they, there seems to be a bit, a bit of a demand there because I'm literally getting emails from people saying, when are you going to make more videos? And um, the reason I stopped doing them, uh, well, there's two reasons, actually. Uh, it, became, it became just a lot of work. It was a lot of work, you know, I was literally filming every day. And then, um, sadly, my, my mother um, passed um, just in June. And it was right just when I was, it, oddly, I was kind of thinking of kind of slowing them down. And then my mum passed. And, and, you know, obviously, when you lose a parent, um, everything changes. You know, you suddenly have to focus on on, on kind of trying to do the right thing by them and, and things to be sorted out. So that's all done, you know, that, that's kind of now taken care of and, and hope mum's in a, I'm sure she's in a much better better place um, with dad, keep my eye on her, I'm sure, keep my, keep my in line or she's keeping him in line. Um, so it's kind of made me think, right, now is the time to kind of go back and do some more fun things. So, you know, so, and she loved me doing that. So I think that's a, an incentive to kind of, to start doing more of those and who knows you know who, who knows where that might lead I, well i can certainly say I, I know i speak for myself i might speak for a lot of people but i think everyone could probably do some etiquette lessons because I, I don't think i've been to a wedding in the last <laughs> the last 10 years where people don't sit at a table and go is the plate on the left or the right <laughs> <laughs> He, he, here's, here's how to make friends. Like the, next, the next time you're at a big event and you sit at the table, I guarantee somebody at the table will be eaten mm. with the mouth open. Okay, I guarantee it. I'm, I'm making a bet with you right now. You will sit at the table and somebody, and people always say to me, how, what do you do in that situation? What, how do you say to somebody, I feel sick because you know I'm having to, and I said, it's quite simple. <laughs> you look across the table and you say, excuse me, and they'll say yes. They'll say, have, have you ever sat opposite a cement mixer? And I guarantee <laughs> at that point, it stops. It's amazing. It works every single time. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> cement mixer. Brilliant. Okay. And if, if, um, if people want to find you anywhere, where would they find you? How can they find out about what you're doing? I'm, I'm, I'm very easy to, to, to stock. Uh, the Royal Butler is the kind of the, the name, the stage name that I go with. You've got the Royal Butler um, website. Uh, you've got the Royal Butler YouTube channel, the Royal Butler Twitter, the Royal Butler Instagram. 
I Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube are all verified, so it's nice and easy to find me because there's a few there's a few fake raw butlers out there. Um, but obviously, I've got the little blue tick, so that that helps that helps people find me. I've, so you've got the wonderful tick. That's what everyone wants. Yeah, you've got there. <laughs> I think I was probably more excited getting the tick than the day I met the queen. Or maybe no, <laughs> I can't say that. No, I think meeting the queen is probably more exciting. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, I'll be careful there. I'll end up in the tower. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on, Grant. It's been amazing, and I feel very privileged. I feel I'm one step closer to the royal family now. Next time, <laughs> next time, hopefully, I'll get my knighthood. Yes, so that'd be good. You, yeah, can you make a knighthood? That'd be amazing. So, and your wife will be a lady. She'll love that lady. So when she reads, you know, you'll have to, you'll have your lady phoning you up to to read your to read your your information to you um and can i just quickly say if, if um i know there's many dyslexia charities out there but the british dyslexia association it's well worth having a little look at their website and the work they do because um as with all the um you know the charities they do an amazing job but they uh they're well worth having a little look a little look at the work that they're doing um and and if you can support them in fact support any obviously dyslexia charity but that that one's particularly close to my heart what a privilege and a pleasure it's been having Grant on the show. I never foresaw myself in a situation where I got to speak to a real life butler. It was fascinating to learn what it was really like. I found Grant quirky, hilarious, lovely to speak to, but most of all, really humble. He's so grounded and extremely positive, which made it so easy for me to get to know him. His positive outlook on dyslexia is something we can all admire. I hope everyone listening enjoyed it as much as I did. And Grant, truly, thank you for coming on the show. I hope we get to speak again one day soon. If you ever want to do any extra etiquette training, feel free to come around my house anytime. Coming up on next week's episode, I'm joined by one of the most exciting athletes in the country right now, Adele Tracy. And I'm really excited to share our conversation with you. That episode's coming next week, wherever you listen to podcasts. Just a couple of quick notes before we go. They're important ones. First off, make sure to subscribe to The Invisible Gift wherever you listen to podcasts so you can automatically be notified about new episodes. One thing that's really important to me is to hear what you guys think about the podcast. I want to hear more about the challenges you're facing, what you're trying to change in your own life, work and family, and hear your inspiring stories of how you've overcome the odds to achieve the incredible. I know because so many of you are dyslexic that asking you to write something to me is not going to work. So I've worked with the production team on The Invisible Gift and we've come up with an idea. Grab your phone and record us a voice note. If you've got an iPhone, use voice memos. On Android, the options are endless. Once you're happy with your message, you can email it to me. My email address is andrew at theinvisiblegift.com. I would love to start sharing some of your audio notes and stories in future episodes. Also, and I'm really excited about this, head to theinvisiblegift.com because that way you can see the amazing artwork that has been commissioned to go along with each episode this season and also find out more about each of the guests I've had the pleasure of speaking to on the podcast. If all of this is way too much for you, I get it. I'm starting a newsletter that includes all this and more and it will come straight to your inbox. It's so simple to sign up at theinvisiblegift.com. You've been listening to the Invisible Gift podcast presented by me, Andrew Kitley, and produced by One Fine Play. This episode was recorded by Kazra. From One Fine Play, James Bishop is the executive producer. Kazra is the audio and visual engineer. Connor Foley is the editorial producer and researcher. Special thanks to Christina, Izzy, and the Cube Studios. Thank you for listening to the Invisible Gift podcast. Podcast.